Well, this is one category where there's both interest and excitement. The Panasonic LX10 takes on the competition with a tiny, lightweight, 20 megapixel camera that includes some truly unique features. It's very close to being both the lightest and the smallest among its 1-inch sensor peers. Wide open, the fixed 24 to 70 millimeter equivalent Leica lens has the fastest aperture, f1.4, in its class. Ramps to f2.8 zoomed in. With 4K video and a flip-up screen, the LX10 is a great camera for video and for vlogging. If only there was a mic input, but the competition doesn't have that either. Audio quality is not bad as long as you stay close, and the stabilization is excellent. Focus is fast and responsive. A variety of auto modes, but of course all the manual controls for exposure and focus that I want although they do tend to be a little kludgy at this size, and there's no viewfinder included or optional. Image and video quality is excellent, even in lower light at higher ISOs. That's the highlights. Let's get to the details. What remains unique to Panasonic is an extensive list of capabilities leveraged from 4K. A separate pamphlet describes the 4K photo modes. In photo terms, 4K is 8 megapixels, so there is a trade-off when using these features. 4K photo is a 30 frame per second burst mode for stills, not video. Press the 4K or Fun 1 button. It requires a U3 class SD card, now called V30, and it's best to use shutter priority with a pretty fast speed, say 1 500th, set using the top dial. The field of view is cropped. In 4K, it's the equivalent of 36 to 108. Incidentally, the zoom lever is variable. Use the lens ring for a stepped zoom, or use settings page 6 to change the lever's behavior to stepped. Another option I like, the lens resume, returns the lens to its previous focal length setting when the camera is powered on. Select one of three 4K modes. The first takes photos as long as the shutter is held down. The second starts with the first press and stops with the second. The third records 30 frames before and 30 frames after the shutter is pressed. Nice flexibility. In playback, scrub to find the image or images you want and save them out as stills. On the card, you'll find the recording as an MP4 file which can also be opened in Photoshop to save out the stills. This is like no other burst mode. Now there's no chance I'll miss the decisive moment. There's also a standard burst mode with four speeds, activated from the drive button at the bottom of the control dial. The fastest, SH and H, have a compromised display mode called Without Live View. H takes 10 5.6 meg fine JPEGs per second with a buffer that lasts for 66 images just over 6 seconds. Buffer clears in about 8 seconds. SH takes 60 shots per second with a 60 frame buffer but is badly compromised. The images revert to the small or 5 megapixel size. The electronic shutter is used and it stops dead when the buffer is full. Although these modes are available elsewhere, I find the Drive button the easiest way to select 4K photo and post-focus modes. Drive also includes three self-timer options, 10 seconds, 2 seconds, and 10 with 3 shots. There are two more Drive modes on the menu, Time Lapse and Stop Motion. Time Lapse can record up to 10,000 minus 1 images. Stop Motion has an Auto Timer mode, or just press the shutter when you're ready. The last two images appear superimposed on the screen to assist alignment. When you're done, create the movie at a wide range of frame rates depending on the quality setting. And this makes the whole process pretty painless. Four aspect ratios, three sizes, use L and 3 to 2 for 20 megapixel images, other combinations provide smaller images. Two JPEG modes, which can be joined with RAW in all combinations. Lots of modes from Intelligent Auto with scene detection and scene with manual scene identification, including 24 selections 
which somehow overlooks snow, to full manual as well as panorama. The menu allows four directions and two sizes. Wide covers about 270 degrees, a long way around. In landscape mode, the narrow dimension is 1920 pixels. In portrait, it's 2560. So even if you're shooting left to right, consider using the up-down setting. There's a tiny built-in pop-up flash, good for about 12 meters. There's no flash shoe, and it doesn't work with 4K photo or the electronic shutter. Shooting in full manual exposure is pleasant with a dedicated aperture ring around the lens and a dedicated shutter dial on top. The two sliding bars indicate which settings are in range. Manual might not be my first choice of modes, but as the capabilities of auto ISO improve, I'm finding it more and more useful as it combines both shutter and aperture control with auto exposure. There's an EV adjustment, but I didn't anticipate that it wouldn't be available in manual with auto ISO. Large and legible meter on screen, it displays zero when you've achieved the optimal settings and also shows the interplay between aperture and shutter settings and auto ISO. Press Fun 3 and then use the Q menu to set ISO. Slightly awkward as there's no dedicated button, but after I decided to use the drive menu for 4K, I assigned ISO to Fun 1. One usability aspect of the Q menu I don't enjoy is that both the top dial and the control circle provide the same function. It would be much nicer if once an item is highlighted, the dial changed the setting. You have to select the item first, then the dial adjusts the setting. I found that awkward with gloves on. In addition to auto, ISO can be set from 125 to 12,800. On the menu, it's called sensitivity, and although I'd have placed the ISO auto limit adjacent, it's down on screen 6, where you'll also find extended ISO. Turning this on enables 25.6. The higher ISOs are noisy, but usable, until we get to 25.6, where they're kind of mushy and soft. While we're here, select Metering, Multi, Center Weighted, or Spot. I'm showing using the controller, but of course this can all be done with touch. The LX10's histogram can be moved around the screen. That's more versatile than the competition. And no one outdoes Panasonic on focus features and flexibility. 49 Area, the intriguing custom for a specific area configuration, 1 Area which can be moved and sized, 8 sizes, and small can be positioned anywhere on the screen using a 100 horizontal and 60 vertical grid. Interestingly, even the extreme edges are usable. Then a very similar sizable movable pinpoint with an expanded view focus assist, face detection with eye detect, and tracking. Press the shutter to activate. It works well with 4K photo mode. It's faster than most. There are three modes, single, continuous, and hybrid, and touch focus, which combined with touch shutter is an elegant solution when autofocus doesn't get it. Manual focus is not selected from this menu, but from a second focus menu on the control panel left button which also includes macro and macro zoom, providing a very small field of view with a lens close enough to cast a shadow on the subject. In manual focus, use the second ring on the lens. A distance guide is displayed while adjusting. A movable, zoomable, expanded view appears on screen to assist. There's a menu option to make this full screen. Peaking is also available as a focus assist. One more thing, post focus, Activated with the Fun 2 button, it's like the 4K photo mode. It records 8 megapixel images, probably best with a tripod. Snap, the scene is analyzed and images are saved. Then touch the screen to select a focus point and save the image. Fun 2 shows peaking on the focused edges. Zoom the image and use the slider to pinpoint the focus. Not done yet. Although you can export the file and focus stack the images in an app like Photoshop, press Fun 1 to do this in camera. Two modes, Auto and Range. 
While this is a spectacular and interesting capability, I will say it's not easy to use in the field. I really find it's a studio kind of feature. But now, you don't have to worry about which end of the eclair should be in focus. Intelligent Auto Mode works well, but can save only JPEG images switched to P for RAW or RAW+. Auto also engages the digital zoom up to two times. You'll see 36 to 216 instead of 108. There's a dedicated white balance button to the right of the control dial with presets and four custom settings as well as degrees Kelvin. Press up to capture from a gray card, down to add custom adjustments. The photo style menu provides an interactive screen to select from several presets and fine tune the individual parameters, contrast, sharpness, and saturation. Creative control mode also provides color effects along with other effect modes like toy, monochrome, miniature, and star effect. Many of these have additional options to adjust and fine tune the effects. Video can be recorded in AVCHD up to 60 frame 28 megabits data rate or MP4 up to 4K 30 frame 100 megabit data rate. There are also 24 frame 4K and 60 and 30 frame HD modes at lower data rates. Four video exposure modes including full manual. High speed video records at 120 frames per second but is silent and available only in HD. Video recording does have time constraints, but 15 minutes of 4K is more than the competition allows. There's a nice beep to warn the limit's been exceeded, but pressing record starts again. And again. And again. Until near the end of an hour of recording, the battery status started to flash, and a few minutes later it died. All of that without an overheating warning. I didn't have the opportunity to try it on a beach in Mexico, but I'm pretty confident saying that overheating isn't going to be an issue. What is an issue, particularly on bright snowy days, is the lack of ND, which the competition does include. With a minimum ISO of 125 and a minimum aperture of f11, it requires a pretty fast shutter speed, not ideal for video, and there's no ability to mount a third-party filter. There's also no auto ISO in manual video mode, which means that shooting in shutter priority is likely your best option. In addition to the 5-axis stabilization, and this is a handheld shot, there's a level shot setting, which after cropping slightly keeps the horizon level automatically. Since I'm always running down on the right, I really appreciate this, but it's not available when shooting 4K. A menu setting can update the level adjustment. A two-time digital zoom is activated by selecting eye zoom, which increases the range to 180 from 90 with minimal quality loss in video or 4K mode to 16. There's a slight pause as it crosses the optical digital threshold. The full digital zoom, which is available only in 4K and video mode, doubles again to 432, but suffers from a loss of quality. In stills mode, Digital zoom can't be selected, but it also can't be highlighted, a situation that occurs throughout the menu. I wish that it would highlight, if only to tell me what I need to change to use it. Live cropping programs a move or zoom for an HD-sized video recording. Set the length of the move, the start position and size, and end position and size, then start recording. The camera creates the program move and then stops recording. Remember to turn it off when you're done. Although interesting, it is somewhat cumbersome to configure and the 20 and 40 second moves really limit its usefulness. I'd also like to be able to continue to record after the 20 or 40 seconds is up. Hopefully these are features to be added next time. The sensor's dynamic range, viewed here on the DSC Lab Xylochart, is about 8 stops. Unique to Panasonic is the ability to change the response curve using a highlight shadow adjustment tool. There are defaults, higher contrast, lower contrast, brighter shadows, but there are also three custom settings. Use the lens ring for highlight adjustments, the top dial for shadow. Referencing the xylochart, although the levels are changing, there's no overall increase to the dynamic range. Combined with the photo style settings, 
This provides the ability to create a wide range of picture profile settings for video production. I prefer a less sharpened and saturated look and that's easy to create here. I wanted to add the highlight shadow feature to the Q menu. First change the Q menu from preset to custom, then open the menu and press down to access the customization feature from the menu. Unfortunately, although there are many interesting capabilities, highlight shadow is not available. You may not agree, but for me, the value of using the custom setting is that all the features are arrayed in a single line across the bottom of the screen. This makes some harder to access, but it means that for all options, it's left right to select, then up down to adjust instead of some up and some down small point, but there's no mic input or headphone output and no audio controls other than a wind noise filter. There is an HDMI port, but provides output only during playback and the tripod socket is really too close to the battery and SD card compartment. Video recordings are saved in single files, about 11 gigs for 15 minutes of 4K. Ad hoc Wi-Fi can be used to send images as well as video to a smartphone or to use the phone as a remote control with Panasonic's free image app. It can't change modes or the aperture. There's a mirror option, which makes vlogging easier, the app also supports geotagging and time sync, and can create photo collages. The playback menu includes extensive raw processing, including photo style, but not effects. It can create videos from time lapse or stop motion images. There's also a great playback trick called light composition to turn a 4K photo set into a time exposure. Pick the first image, then the last, but clearly this works best when a tripod is used. Battery life is short, it makes sense, the battery's tiny, and although some competitors can power from USB, here it's charging only. Panasonic's boatload of unique features make the LX10 a truly unique camera, as long as you plan to use them. The lack of a viewfinder might be an issue for some, but otherwise it's a pocketable travel camera that's great for serious photographers.